The hardest hit ball of the Cardinals season came off the bat of Jordan Walker last night. Is 2025 the year the Cardinals just play him every day and let his star shine? What's going on, everyone, and welcome into this edition of Be Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. It's the afternoon hours now of Thursday, September 19th, 2024. Last night, I was at Bush Stadium for the Cardinals' big win, 10-5 to over the Pirates, as Jordan Walker struck the hardest hit ball, according to StatCast exit velocity, of the entire Cardinals' season. Prior to this game, Wilson Contreras had the lead. It was a ball hit at 115.3 miles per hour. And that ranked like 25th across Major League Baseball all season long. Jordan Walker topped it last night with a double down the left field line, 115.5 miles per hour off the bat. Absolutely smoked. Kind of ironic. I don't know if it's irony, if it's just hilarious that the ball was struck onto the ground. It was technically a ground ball. But I've never really seen a ground ball hit the left field wall in the corner with the authority that Walker's double did last night. And it cleared the bases as part of a six-run Seventh inning for the Cardinals as they beat the Pirates 10-5. to Appreciate you guys for joining me today. We'll talk some Walker. We'll talk about Sonny Gray's start in his season as he eclipsed 200 strikeouts last night. Not too many guys across baseball doing that these days, and Sonny Gray makes it happen with his game last night. Didn't pitch great and gave up four runs, ultimately got into a spot of trouble, and then Matthew Libertor ends up giving up a homer, some inherited runners then score as a result. So we'll talk about Sonny's game and his season. It's just kind of interesting to think forward to 2025. It's really all we have at this point in Cardinals land as they're two games above 500 this season, but the season is winding down with just 10 games to go. So it's more instructive to think about the long range and who could be part of this mixture next year. We know Sonny Gray, of course, is under contract. So what are the expectations from Gray now that we've seen a year from him in a Cardinal uniform? Uh, Certainly the swing and miss that was advertised for Gray was part of his game this year. And I would make the case that Sonny Gray, for as much as it was kind of an up and down season, outside of just missing a couple starts to begin the year, he's still going to be the innings leader on this team. And that's Something that we talked about throughout the year, how Sonny Gray workload-wise has not been a guy in consecutive years to throw even 140-plus innings since about a decade ago when he did consecutive 200-inning seasons in 14 and 15. Well, this is going to be that for him after last year's 184. He's now up to 166 in the third innings with 203 strikeouts after last night's 8K performance. So we'll talk about Sonny as well as one of the guys that relieved him following Libertor's home run that he gave up. That kind of changed the face of the game there for a minute as the Pirates took a quick lead, but the Cardinal bats did battle back, which was really good to see that six run seventh inning that was highlighted by the Jordan Walker swing. Cardinals end up getting this win, but the reliever that finished it off, Michael McGreevy was recalled for Lance Lynn. We kind of talked about yesterday on B-Shave Daily how Lynn seemingly was done for the season, maybe done as a Cardinal, and that news came to fruition a little bit after we recorded on Wednesday. As Lynn went on the I.L., they called up McGreevy, said, hey, he's not necessarily going to be in the rotation right away, but he is going to be on the team. He's going to be in the bullpen, and they'll find spots to use him. And I asked Ollie Marmel last night after McGreevy's outing how much you can gain from A stretch like this where Michael McGreevy is going to be with the big league club for the final push of the season. He's here on this homestand. He's going to get to take that road trip with the team, maybe even make a start during that final road trip as they'll go to Colorado and San Francisco. And what can a young player gain from that, getting in this environment? And all he said, yeah, that's a big part of why he's here, to get him around the guys and kind of get him integrated a little bit. We know Mason Wynn benefited a ton from that at the end of last season. Maybe Michael McGreevy does that now and and turns himself into a guy that should be considered for that 2025 roster. I think he will come into spring training at a minimum competing for a spot. But it's kind of funny. Michael McGreevy said he hasn't thrown in relief out of the bullpen since college at UC Santa Barbara and was told that, hey, that might be the role for you when you first come up and then we'll kind of take it from there. But he said, eh, I was told by my former coaches, just like riding a bike when he texted him and said he's going to be going out of the bullpen again. And it kind of looked that way. Michael McGreevy, even though there is some hard contact that has happened against him in both of his big league outings, both of those outings have resulted now in a major league win. Three innings of scoreless baseball last night. Didn't walk anybody, just two hits. And he struck out four to lower his ERA with the Cardinals in the two games to a 0.90. Maybe this guy ends up being viable and the Cardinals give him a look. It'll be interesting to see what opportunities he gets over the next couple of weeks 
as well. But that's all coming up on B-Shave Daily today. We'll also go down on the farm since it's been a minute since we've done that. Of course, brought to you by Hastings Layers Premium Eggs. I want to let you know, though, real quick that I'm proud to partner with Underdog Fantasy, my favorite place to play fantasy games. Check out their pick them. Easy to play by picking two to eight stats of your favorite players, choosing whether they'll go higher or lower. If it sounds like fun, sign up with my promo code BSHAFE. It's there on your screen to claim your free pick and your first time deposit offer up to a thousand in bonus cash. Can't wait to see your guys' entries on football, baseball, basketball, hockey. Everything under the sun is there on Underdog Fantasy. So appreciate you guys for checking them out and supporting the show. Again, that link is in the description below to this video with the promo code BSHAFE. All right, let's hop into it. Last night, Jordan Walker, it was just a one-for-four game, and I think his OPS for the month of September, which he came in with a 9-10 OPS for the month, actually went down a little bit, going one-for-four with just a double, but it was a three-run double that put the game out of reach after the Cardinals had briefly lost the lead after a Matthew Libertor home run allowed in his first batter face, relieving Sonny Gray. So it was that kind of spot where, man, enough times this season we haven't really seen the Cardinals necessarily bounce back after getting pushed around a little bit. And, man, that seventh inning was great. It led off with a Mason Wynn home run to tie the game. And a lot of times you see a leadoff home run, you don't necessarily get the rally to follow. But the Cardinals were grinding out at bats. And, really, you can look at the middle of the order last night. Burleson had a couple of good base knocks, two for five. Uh, Goldschmidt was one for five, but he also reached base another time and scored a run. So he had two runs scored. Arenado really kind of turning it on in this game. Three for three with a couple of walks. So Nolan on base Five times, he also had a double for one of those hits. And Brendan Donovan, he nuked one off of Jake Woodford. Old friend alert. When I saw Jake Woodford was starting this game, and no offense to Jake, but it's been tough for him. I I learned this yesterday listening to the radio broadcast as I drove into Bush Stadium uh, after doing my radio show for KTGR last night. Jake Woodford's last major league win, and he's bounced around. He was with the White Sox, and then they DFA'd him. He went to the Pirates. I think they DFA'd him and brought him back for yesterday's game as he was unclaimed. So he was still in their minor leagues. Jake Woodford's last major league win came in London as a member of the Cardinals. That was last June. He's 0-6, I believe, this season. Maybe 0-7 now. Uh, Nope, didn't get charged. Well, no, of course, he did not get charged with the loss last night because the Pirates took the lead after he came in, as I just said. Bednar, actually, David Bednar has not been the same. Former stud closer of the Pirates. He's got a 6-1-7 ERA this year, and he's who the Cardinals were able to tag to begin that inning uh, last night in the seventh where they were able to go a little bit gangbusters. So that was kind of good to see, but not good to see if you're David Bednar, which kind of makes you wonder, and I'm not saying this is coming for Ryan Helsley, but when you think about relief pitchers, they are so fickle. Even the, I mean, Bednar was on top of the world like a year ago. His numbers were unbelievable there for a little while for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and you kind of wonder, is that somebody that in the offseason, if the Cardinals are looking to go a little bit of a different direction, not to rebuild necessarily, but to retool and reload, would this be a decent time to trade Ryan Helsley going into the final year of his contract rather than try to either extend him and you're paying the money for a guy that is a relief pitcher, so you just don't know what the future is going to hold. You know, Bednar is only 29 years old in his age 29 season. He might have turned 30. Let me take a quick look at that. Uh, nope, he turns 30 in October, though. So, like, he's not over the hill by any means. Ryan Helsley's a young guy. He's a young guy, and he's a powerful pitcher. But you wonder if you give him a four-year extension or something like that instead of letting him walk into free agency and getting nothing for him, do you end up regretting that down the line? Not because it's Helsley, but because he is a reliever. I'm not judging Helsley on anything to do with Helsley. I'm judging it based on the position he plays. Hard-throwing reliever. We just see those guys tend to burn out. They burn hot, and they burn out. And David Bednar last year at a 2.0 ERA led the league in saves with 39. This year, 6.17 ERA has been demoted to middle relief for one of the worst teams in the NL Central. So that's kind of the way that it can go. Does that make you? Does that serve as a cautionary tale for you, Cardinals fans, or do you just say Helsley's so good? I don't like this kind of talk. I don't want to hear it. You need to have Ryan Helsley long term because he's he's Hell's bells. Gosh dang it! I could understand either side. The fandom in in someone could say, look, that's Ryan freaking Helsley. You're an insane person if you want to get rid of him when he's at the top of his game. Or the other side of it is more like the business-oriented approach of you're insane if you don't trade him at the the height of his trade value, which could be this coming off offseason, um, knock on wood, provided he stays healthy through the rest of the year. A lot of folks did think they should have traded him at the deadline when the relief market was going absolutely berserk. Could have probably netted a couple of top 100 prospects for him. Um, 
I don't know what the Cardinals are going to do. I, that, that feels like a really icky thing. To say you're going to let a, a, a Kyle Gibson walk and not pick up his option, to say you're going to let a, a Lance Lynn walk and not pick up his option, that's one thing. To actively say, hey, this guy that we have under contract is we're going to trade him away when he's one of our best players. That And look, he is. He's one of the Cardinals' best players, one of the most productive players at their respective positions. Um, that does feel a little bit different. That feels a little bit rebuildy rather than retooly. But we have seen to the north a team in this division do things like this and do it successfully. How about the Brewers when it comes to Hader? Right? They got pieces for Hader that ultimately led to them getting William Contreras. They were prepared to get a guy like that in a three-team trade when the Atlanta Braves got Sean Murphy. They sent Esteri Ruiz to Oakland at the time, which I guess they're still Oakland for the moment. And that was a deal that netted them William Contreras in a three-team trade. And he's one of their core pieces now in Milwaukee. They did it this season when it came to Corbin Burns. Now, I, the, the jury is still a little bit out on what the return on Burns is going to bring. I know they got D.L. Hall, a pitcher back in that trade. Um, and I haven't, truth be told, kept up on exactly what his numbers are right now for Milwaukee, what he's been doing this year. But the team as a whole has been more than fine. D.L. Hall's got a 4.9 ERA um, in some limited duty this season for the Milwaukee Brewers. I think he's been in the minors for a bulk of the year, but he's been pretty good down there at 3.7 ERA. He's a 25-year-old, could be a future rotation piece for Milwaukee. They're still winning despite those decisions is my point. And that's a, a, an occasion of people ripped him when they traded Corbin Burns. And you said, you're you're going to regret it. You're not going to end up in the playoffs because of it. And here they are leading the Central. They're, they're going to win the Central, right? And with Hayter, it's kind of the same thing. Ends up coming around and it actually... Even in the moment, we ripped them. We said, oh, you cost your team the playoffs that year. The clubhouse tanked after that. It did. It was a move that cost them in the short term. In the long term, though, I think they're thriving as a result of it. That is the kind of tough business decision that we have not seen the Cardinals make. I'm not suggesting that there's a right or wrong answer to it, but this is a topic that's going to definitely extend into the offseason as we're going to, going to have to kind of di dissect it. I just wanted to bring it up in an extended tone here when it comes to that David Bednar. It's an interesting comp. Um, in, in so far as where the Cardinals are going to be. And by the way, if you're trying to trim payroll, Helsley's going to make, he's going to get a huge raise in ARP. It's going to be a massive raise because he's been one of the best relievers in baseball this year. So whether or not that's something that's under consideration, I don't know. But I could see both sides of the fan base kind of having, being at odds on that. And, and I don't actually know the right answer, but y'all can tell me your opinion on it because I do think it is an interesting topic. I just don't want to come off as the guy that's like anti Ryan Helsley to say to trade a player that's so productive on the team. I, I speak strictly of it through a business standpoint and from the notion of look at what happens sometimes to relievers that look like they're on top of the world and then maybe so they're not anymore after that. But that's kind of a side quest for this podcast. I want to talk a little bit about the offense and how productive those guys were. 14 hits, four walks. They were getting on base a ton last night. When I saw Jake Woodford, that's what I was talking about, was getting called up for this game. I thought the Cardinals are probably going to have a pretty good day offensively. They only got four runs against Woodford came a little bit early in innings two and three, and then they uh, were shut down by him a little bit as they went along, uh, but were able to get it done against the bullpen. Normally when you see a, a team call up a, a random guy from AAA, it kind of feels like the Cardinals are not going to have the edge because it's like, oh, they don't have the book on this guy. They don't know. Well, Jake Woodford was on this team, and they know everything about him, so I thought that was kind of going to be advantage Cardinals, especially with the way Woodford has struggled this year, uh, and it was. That ended up working out, and we didn't question at the time the Cardinals – letting Woodford go, non-tendering him instead of paying him like a million dollars or whatever it would have been back in November. Uh, but this season has kind of proven the Cardinals right on him. We like Jake Woodford, but uh, he is, uh, to put it kindly, limited in his effectiveness on the mound. He's got a 7 9 seven ERA this season. But the Cardinals got to him. They got to Bednar and then Jordan Walker to see him be able to cap it off after what happened earlier in the game where defensively he had some moments of misadventure out in right field. He said after the game that ball that that sailed over his head, kind of a sinking liner into the gap, he got a beat on it at first, but then he just plain out lost it in the lights. He threw his glove up, but he was kind of in self-preservation mode. You don't want to get conked in the head by a ball and end up with a concussion or worse. Um, so I, it happens. I, I think he did say, I, I hopefully am going to get better as time goes on, but those balls in the gap at that part in the game, that part of the evening, the lights just tend to you know, just tend to find it. And I know a lot of fans, anytime they hear about a guy not seeing the ball, they say, hey, check his eyes, this and that. I think it's a combination of factors. The the game speeds up on you when you are in that situation and you're not a guy who's played a lot of outfield in your life. And I get it. At this point, he's played outfield for multiple seasons, so you'd like to think 
that he's going to to be improving uh, in, in that regard at this point. But it is one of those things that happens, and he's 22. It's part of the growth process. Um, this is not a pennant race, so this is why. Jordan Walker's out there every day. When he wasn't out there every day and we were complaining about the way that he was being utilized, it was a pennant race. That's still the way that Ollie Marmol and the Cardinals viewed it. So no, they trusted Lars Newbar more. They trusted the other outfielders more out there. I think it was as much about their offense as it was their defense at that point. But now this is the the, the timing of where the Cardinals are is play Jordan Walker every day. He's got to play 150 games next year, even if that's DHing for a, a couple dozen games. He's got to be in the lineup because this is how you get Jordan Walker from point A to point B. It's having him play and having him go through that growth process. And the Cardinals have not been a good organization about this in recent years. I've talked about this. I talked about it yesterday, how they've always been pressured by the fan base and they're in win now mode and you don't have time for development at the big league level. Remember Mike Matheny's comment? He said, we're not in the development business at the big league level. And a lot of people didn't like the way that was framed. Um, and it, it was it was crass of him to say it that way. Um, with regard to, I think that was actually about maybe Oscar Tavares back in the day. But the, the point there is that because of the pressure on the Cardinals every year, year in and year out to win, and that comes from the fan base, that comes from the expectations built over the course of time, and it's not a bad thing. But because of that, you you maybe end up missing out on the growth processes of a of a guy like Sandy Alcantara, Zach Gallen. Maybe you could throw a Rosarena into that. Maybe you could throw a Dallas Garcia into that. Fair or unfair, I'm just kind of going through the, the list of different guys to which it applies. Jordan Walker is kind of the next where it's like, hey, go the other way on this one. Just let him play for a full season in 2025 and see what it looks like because the raw the raw tools are there. He just needs the experience. And Jordan Walker, I think, is a guy that for as much as he's just got all the physical tools in the world, he's he's got to find that killer instinct, I think, a little bit more frequently. And that's not I'm not saying that as a negative. That's just something that comes with time um, and confidence. He's got to find that confidence. Don't let Jordan Walker become a guy who's not confident. Build him up. Do not tear him down would be my advice to the Cardinals organization. He's a great kid. He's a great uh, a guy who can be an unbelievable ambassador for this team. Uh, the Cardinals need a guy like this to pan out. you got to build into him. And I think the Cardinals are doing a better job of that now. I think they realize that they've that they kind of got caught up a little bit into the, the got to win now, got to answer the demands of the fan base, and it, and development kind of took a back seat in moments where decisions were made that could have been, if development was top of mind, could have been handled a little bit differently. Uh, but you learn from that as an organization. The same way that we want players to learn from their mistakes, I think we should be fair to the Cardinals and say they got to learn from their mistakes as well. And I think they're, they're seeing with Jordan Walker – you put him out there every day, and you see what that looks like. And I think that's got to be their approach 2025. He doesn't see another day in Memphis for the rest of his life unless he's on an injury rehab That's or, or wants to go there for some barbecue. <laughs> like that's, that's the way I view it for Jordan Walker at this point. So we'll see if the Cardinals end up seeing it that way as well. But love to see what we saw from him uh, offensively, especially last night. And the fact that defensively there was a miscue, and then he bounces back from it. Right? Like that didn't define his night. And that's such a big thing that the 22-year-old players have got to go through and have. They've got to have those experiences or they're never going to be able to find the other way and the other side of, of that kind of confidence matrix. So great to see from Jordan Walker. I think we can feel really good about uh, that swing last night. Dude, 115 and a half miles per hour off the bat. I don't care if it's in the air, on the ground, that's going to play um, just about no matter what. So really good to see. The tools are there. I think Jordan Walker is going to be just fine. Uh, and, and, and I'm throwing my hat in the ring that he's just got to play every day next year. Unless he needs a rest. That's really what it boils down to. Uh, Sonny Gray, quick roundabout eval on his season. 166 innings. He's got a 3.84 ERA. Um, that's higher than 2022. Higher certainly than last year when he was a Cy Young candidate in the American League. But all in all, I, I think an okay first season. He allowed 21 home runs this year. That's a career high. And his season's not over, but it might like it might be. Any veteran in this rotation could be the guy that skips out on their last couple of starts so that McGreevy gets a shot. Um, you know, Gibby feels a little more likely than that. Could be, you know, could be anybody. We know Lance Lynn is the first um, to kind of to bow out because they had a six-man rotation. He was going through the knee stuff all year anyway, and it could have lined up for him to pitch on Sunday, but because they've got six starters, including him, it just probably didn't make a lot of sense with the knee and everything else, and he wasn't going to, let's just be honest, he wasn't going to call on the road trip, uh, so, you know. It's very Lance, but that's come on. They're not that 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 was appropriate with everything he's grinded through this year uh, with the physical stuff. It made sense to say, hey, you're pitching Sunday or you're not pitching. And I and I liken it to they left the the room open for him to pitch Sunday if he needed slash wanted to. Let's say he struggled in the game this week. It would have lined up five days later for him to pitch the final game of the the regular season. 
but he pitched so well, kind of like Wainwright did last year when he could have done one more start, I think. And, and it was like, okay, we actually don't need you to do it again. Uh, we'll let you bat, and that'll be kind of it. I think that's sort of where it is for Lance Lynn at this point, where he had a great start, and you could end it with the Cardinals on a high note. It felt sentimental enough that I don't think I don't expect him back next year, um, but I do hope he pitches again somewhere. But if he doesn't want to, I mean, he's done a lot in this game, so would understand that either way. As far as Sonny, uh, the the FIP is what I wanted to hone in on. Three point one three was his fielding independent pitching this year. Last year he had a two point eight three FIP that led all of baseball. And it matched his ERA of 2.79 with Minnesota. This year, the FIP is not much different. 3.13 to 2.83 suggests he didn't pitch much worse. Last year, he led baseball in home run rate. 0.4 home runs against per nine innings. This year, 1.1 home run against per nine innings. Home runs not only kind of gravitated back toward the mean, they exceeded it in the other direction. He had bad homer luck this year compared to good homer luck last year. Now you'd have to go back to all 21 homers he's given up and say like, Okay, what ballpark was this in? Should this have been a home run? Whatever. But you know what? The home runs are the home runs. There's really no excuses on it. And and I think that's – but that's a, enough to where if you take away, let's say only 18 of the 21 should have been legit homers. All right, his ERA is now 3.6 or whatever instead of 3.8. Like, the margins were pretty slim on that. The one thing about him is, though, like – and we knew this. He's not a workhorse. He's not a guy that within a game is often going to be able to go seven, eight innings – because he he does he tires he gives everything he's got throughout and he's he's more of a five and dive than we than we maybe build him to be when we saw 184 innings on his ledger last year but that's why I kept talking about it all off season and into the year I said he doesn't he's not gone back to back seasons of 160 innings he's not gone back to back seasons of at least 140 in both of those seasons since 2015 so that's just kind of part of his makeup that you have to understand and all he often talks about he's very vocal about where he's at. So all he knows when he might feel like he needs to come out of a game. They said coming into that sixth inning last night, he was very vocal between innings about where he was. And I think it's better than the alternative. I don't mind that Sonny Gray is this way. Some fans, I see the old school mentality of he should be able to go eight innings. He's a starter. But like it's fine if he throws five or six innings. And then when he's hyper-efficient, it'll be the days where he goes seven because he puts so much into it. And he, you know, he's a very meticulous guy when it comes to his arm care and taking care of his body. I think a pitcher who is so hyper aware of all those things, as much as you might kind of roll your eyes sometimes, if he, if you're like, wow, a pitcher should never be asking out of a game or, to, you know, I just don't think that's got a good handle on actually the way that this goes down in major league baseball. When you're in that clubhouse, when you're doing the arm care he's doing to try to keep his, try to keep his himself in the game and in the season for his team. I don't mind that one bit. And even still, he's going to lead the Cardinals in innings. So, at the end of the day, I think that's um, pretty commendable and, and overall solid season. Maybe a little bit of a letdown, but I think you can isolate it to the home runs as being the reason. Other than that, pretty solid debut season from Gray. Uh, hopefully he can can minimize the home runs next year, and I think if he does, he's a guy with a low three ZRA and, and back to being a Cy Young candidate. But uh, those are kind of my thoughts on Sonny. And then as far as McGreevy, I just think it's really good to have him around the team and to, and to get some big league opportunities. Like you could also look a little sideways at his at his scoring line if you're checking out Statcast and seeing the number of triple digit exit velocities that he gives up. But he's very I call him uh, he's very Palante Junior in the way that he could come through and join this rotation next year. In my opinion, he had a 4.02 ERA in AAA this season, which is a, a slight improvement off of where he was last year. And he really picked it up in the second half of the season. And we've also seen a decent bit of strikeout stuff from McGreevy compared to what I really expected to see. He had four strikeouts in three innings last night. Like, that'll that'll play. And I'm not sure if he's going to be a 1K per inning guy at the big league level, probably below that. But I also think that he, like Palante, we've seen Palante bring that out of himself when he needs it. And uh, I, I think for as much as we did see McGreevy stall out a little bit at Memphis last year with a 4.49 ERA, 4.02 this season, uh, 150 innings, so he's gotten the workload up a little bit. 138 strikeouts in 150 innings at that feels like a good goal and target for him to eventually be able to be that kind of guy at the big league level on a per nine basis, 8.3 Ks per nine. If he could be eight Ks per nine at the big league level, he gets ground balls like Palante does. Uh, the one thing that he doesn't really deal with quite as much, I think at the big league level especially, is going to be walks compared to Palante. Uh, he's got 44 walks in 150 innings in the minors. I think that's more because of the minor league strike zone. I think he'll actually have fewer walks um, when he gets to the big leagues on a consistent basis. Ten innings in the big leagues this year, just one walk. Um, I think he's going to be a pretty good command guy who's going to be able to get ground balls. Yeah, they're going to hit balls hard sometimes, but if you keep it on the ground, 
a la Dakota Hudson pre Tommy John surgery when he could throw a little bit harder and and Tommy John I, I think he didn't quite bounce back from. I think he could be that, and I and I know that that's kind of like people are going to go. Well, that's moving the wrong direction. We want swing and miss. The the types of guys like Hudson are who you're kind of trying to get away from. But Andre Pallante is currently a very good example of it can work, and especially in 2025 where I, I do think the Cardinals are going to still have pretty good defensive play behind these types of pitchers, and you're not paying him, and he could learn to maybe, as he gets a little stronger and gets a little, he's still a very young guy, Michael McGreevy. As he learns to just kind of get a little bit more himself, he's 24 years old, he could add maybe another tick of velo and, and potentially a little bit more swing and miss and be a guy that is a really sturdy number four, number five big league starter for a long, long time. Like, that's the hope for McGreevy. It seemed like that hope had been lost with how he pitched last year and kind of stalled out after being co-minor league pitcher of the year. Uh, but I do think that he is somebody that can um, can bring that to the table again. As he's, I think he's gone through a lot of growth this year, and it'll be effective to have him on the big league club with this roster as they go through the remainder and the final push of their season. It's kind of the way I look at it. Let me know how you guys are viewing Michael McGreevy now. Has your thoughts on him changed now that we've seen him a couple of times at the big league level um, compared to kind of just checking out minor league games that you get to watch or the box scores on McGreevy not being a big swing and miss guy and just not having great numbers in Memphis. Um, after a couple of years ago, he was really good in the lower levels of the minors. Let me know how you feel about that. That's our topics on the Big League Club for today. Let's go ahead and finish the show by going down on the farm. Mm-hmm. It's time to go down on the farm. Mm-hmm. Brought to you by Hastings Layers Premium Eggs. You'll be happier in a jackass eating thistle. Huh? Mm-hmm. Taking a look at the Memphis Redbirds from Wednesday, we saw Sam Robertson. He's kind of dealt with some on and off injuries. He pitched last night, four and two-thirds innings, allowed four runs, three of them earned. He's got a four and a half ERA with Memphis this year. Not 100% sure what the future holds for Robertson. Him and Kloffenstein, who I think Kloffenstein's been injured as well. Those are two guys that uh, hopefully by spring we see those guys able to be healthy and be competing for spots. And look, even if those guys turn into big league depth as far as uh, bullpen pitchers and they can carve out a niche there if they can't stick in the rotation, that could still be something we look back on from that 2023 trade deadline and say, hey, that's not bad. Maybe you know, maybe you got a little bit of something there. Um, so that's kind of good to see from him just to be back in healthy is the main thing. Victor Scott, he's been playing every day. We know we kind of wish to see him in the big leagues, but it is what it is. He went one for three with a run scored in an RBI as a leadoff man for Memphis. Just want to kind of remind you guys, as much as Scott had growth at the big league level, his OPS this year in Memphis is 603. So that's kind of where I push back a little bit on this idea that he's big league ready and should be, you know, the guy or whatever in center field. The part that I think Cardinals fans were spot on about is you could make the case that he could gain and benefit from playing every day in the big leagues down the stretch like Michael or like Mason Wynn did last year. And to not be getting that opportunity right now is a little bit frustrating. Um, But look, I think they have belief in Siani as well. And they also want to get a look at him, as we've talked about, for whether it's showcasing a trade or potentially, you know, getting a, a better handle on what he could bring to the table next season as part of that mixture. You know, make that decision. And maybe they know that Victor's part of the mix and they want to kind of get a last look as to whether they should move forward with Siani or, the, or not. That could be part of it as well there. Uh, Ryan Lutis, two innings of scoreless relief. Roycroft, scoreless relief for two and a third. Um, getting the save. Those guys did a nice job. And, and Roycroft, Lutis, I think both those guys could be in the mix for bullpen spots as well. They were obviously depth pieces for the Cardinals this year at various times. Uh, and finishing up here, let's talk about the Springfield Cardinals. They're actually in the playoffs now. On Tuesday, they got a win over the Arkansas Travelers in game one of their playoff series, 4-1. to one. Kind of fun to see. Uh, Komar was a starter for that game. Six innings, one, runs, uh, run, one run allowed, seven Ks. I believe he's the guy who had spent some time with Memphis, struggled, um, and then was sent back down to A. Brandon Komar, 25 years old. Um, and has had some some good numbers at Double A, but at Triple A, it was not really working for him earlier this season. An ERA over five, but uh, makes sense if they're trying to win a playoff series that they would throw him. Tink Hens, uh, they're saying no structural damage, but he's dealing with some injuries again. I again, I think long term there is reason to be concerned about whether he holds up as a starter um, with just the number of injuries that he has had. Um, I don't know if you can necessarily trade him based on you know kind of what's happened recently with the injuries this year. Um, but I'm not also saying I'm giving up on Tink Kent's either. Just hope that he can get healthy because he's a guy that could mix in as early as 2025 if, if he could get the physical stuff right. Uh, but we do want to mention Chase Davis, man. Ever since getting called up to double A has been an interesting piece. And he came through with a home run in that playoff game. Two for four, two runs scored, two RBIs for Chase Davis, a prospect that 
had been in the low levels of the minors. Cardinals called him up now for the stretch push, and in Double A, he has done a solid enough job, a 7.52 OPS overall in his 28 at bats from Double A, but also two for four with a home run yesterday, or this was Tuesday rather, in a playoff series. Uh, Springfield is going to have another playoff game. They were off yesterday. They'll play on Thursday, game two of that series against Arkansas. That's going to do it for this edition of Be Shaved Daily. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me and for listening to the show. I promise we're going to be daily once again after a little bit of a, of a lean period over the last week or so. Um, we're back three days in a row now, and we'll continue that for as much as we possibly can outside of maybe like a Saturday. I'm going back to the Mizzou game, that sort of thing. But uh, Sunday, last home game of the season, one more week after that of Cardinal baseball, and then we shift our focus, still doing podcasts regularly, talking about the Cardinal off season. The way you support the show is by subscribing, checking out the Discord, DM me if you need that link, and consider a YouTube membership plus Underdog Fantasy as we shift into football season in a lot of ways. Um, check that out if you want to play some Underdog Fantasy, promo code BSHAFE. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on BSHAFE Daily. Peace.